morning, everyone. Today, we're back in Ephesians, Ephesians 6, 17, the last two items of the armor. As uh, I've been covering, the armor of God is revealed in Ephesians chapter 6. So today, we're just going to do this one verse, but I'm going to do an overview and show us in a bigger context what it really means to be safe and to stand firm in Christ. So let me read the text, Ephesians 6, 17, from the ESV. And take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God. Let's pray. Thank you, Lord, for revealing these things to us and helping us understand how we can stand firm even though there's a raging battle going on around us we're under severe attack from hostile powers. May we listen to you and stand firm. Help us, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, so in Ephesians, we have this analogy of the armor of God. And we have already revealed to us different parts of it. We have the belt of truth, okay, that we, that we uh, put around our waist. We have the breastplate of righteousness, the shield of faith, and so on. And so here we have the helmet of salvation, and then we'll talk about the sword of the spirit. Now, in this particular case, as in some of the others, there's allusions back to the book of Isaiah. So Paul is making an allusion, and the allusion is to Isaiah 59, 17 from the Septuagint, or the commonly used Greek Bible that the New Testament authors cited. And I have a whole slide about that, and we'll look at it when I flip slides, but just know that we're going to talk about that and how this responds to an allusion, I mean to Isaiah 59, 17. And so this whole uh, part, Ephesians 6, 11 through 17, is an analogy uh, to armor, literal armor that a Roman soldier would wear. But it, Paul's making a point that we must stand, that's the imperative, stand in this armor that's been provided. Now, what we need to realize is that all the pieces of the armor are aspects of the gospel. And today I want to warn about allegorization. I don't know if there's been any more allegorization done. Maybe the Song of Solomon has been allegorized throughout history, but this one really gets quite the usage when people want to allegorize. And sadly, through much of church history, the more clever people are allegorizing, the more astute people deem them to be. But we're not here to prove how clever we are. We're not here to write fiction. We're not here to write romance or military uh, novels or anything else. We're here to understand what God said. And I'll give you some examples of how this has been allegorized. And in every case, it just detracts from what's actually said. So here we have an analogy based on actual armor that a Roman soldier would have. I explained how that was and what those pieces were in the reality of the soldier and then the point that Paul's making. So there are verbs, as I have listed on my PowerPoint, belt up, put on, shod feet, take up. They're fitting for how a Roman soldier would actually implement these pieces of armor. The shield was a big, massive thing. I described that. It said in front of you, flaming arrows would not turn it on fire, at least right away. And we covered that as I've gone through this. 
So as I just said, I'm going to talk about why we shouldn't allegorize and we should just take this for what it says. Eric and I will consistently tell you what the author means by God's grace as we can understand that. I thought Eric did a great job in Sunday school today doing that with eschatology. So these verbs, uh, I'm going to read my statement, correspond to how actual armor that the Roman soldier would wear would be put on, not some process we need to figure out that is not specified in the text. For example, some have prescribed sayings that are to be stated each morning. Literally, this has been prescribed. You want to be safe? Here's what you do. You get up in the morning and you say this. I put on truth. I put on righteousness. I put on faith. I take up my sword. So their sayings, maybe they're innocuous, but I think in a bigger scheme it's not innocuous, and I'm going to show you why today. Because the Bible is telling us to believe the promises of God. The imperative that covers all of these pieces of armor is stand. The Greek has an imperative, stand. Here's the pieces. They're all gospel truths. Stand and do not let the spiritual hostile powers knock you off your feet. Remember the wrestling? We wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against various principalities, powers, authorities, and what have you. And I showed you that in the real world part of the analogy, wrestling in the Greco-Roman world was about knocking your opponent off his feet. So standing would be the goal. If you don't get knocked off your feet, you win. So, um, analogies do not give liberty to allegorize or to create some process that people would like. And I think something is interesting, as I've read a lot of the material in my studies of Luke, Acts, Colossians, Ephesians, about what the religious world was like in Asia Minor, all of the religions had these processes. They had incantations. They had secret names of deities. They had uh, different structures built where someone would try to enter and work their way through. That was in Colossians. Having entered, they claimed they had some higher status. And sometimes the incantations were written down were quite, quite long. They had ones that would be used for curse-breaking. They would appeal to various deities that might help with this or might help with that. And that's kind of just how religion worked. And I'm going to show you today that in contrast to that, this gospel is about what God's done for us, not about us keeping some secret religious process or knowing some secret names or what have you. And as I've said many, many times in the last 20 years, Roman Catholicism is a paganized version of so-called Christianity, although they've, they've lost a lot of it, and they have all of the things the pagans had. Okay? Secret processes, things to say. Say this, say this, do this, kneel, have the incense. There's, there's more things that I even know about because I've never been Catholic. But what it is, is trying to create paganism and call it Christian. Let's just borrow from all the pagans. But in contrast, Paul isn't prescribing incantations, secret names, talking to various beings in the heavenlies by their name. Some false teachers say you got to know the names of the demons or they're going to get you. We've just recreated paganism. And I'm going to show you today from Scripture. I, I want to make it so clear that it's impossible to miss it. We are safe 
because we're in Christ, and therefore being saved, we must stand. And don't depart from the gospel. Back to what I wanted to, what I wrote down in my notes. Ironically, this approach turns stand into something like incantations. I just point that out. So we know Paul is referring to salvation as used in Isaiah 59, 17. And that'll help us understand that he wants us to stand. So let me turn to that right here. And I've got to do this because we had a little malfunction going on. Isaiah 59, 16 and 17. And he, and he saw that there was no man and was astonished that there was no one to intercede. Then his own arm brought salvation to him. And his righteousness upheld him. And he put on righteousness like a breastplate and a helmet of salvation on his head. And he put on garments of vengeance for clothing and wrapped himself with a zeal as a mantle. This is the divine warrior. This is a, a, a reference to Christ, the divine warrior. And who brought salvation. And this is interesting. Now if you look at this passage, notice that it says he put on garments of vengeance. But what you find in the New Testament is that when Old Testament passages are cited, often the Old Testament passage has parts that apply to the first advent and other parts that apply to the second advent. I talked about this last week in Sunday school. Remember in Luke 4, verse 18, 19, Jesus comes into Nazareth in the synagogue, his hometown, and he opens up the scroll of the prophet and he reads Isaiah 61, 1 and 2 about the favorable day of the Lord to the, the bring healing and so on. And he said, in fact, here it is. The spirit of the Lord is upon me because he anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He sent me to proclaim release to captives, recover his sight to blind, to set free those who are oppressed, to proclaim the favorable year of the Lord. Isaiah 61, 1 and 2, minus the part about vengeance, which is in Isaiah 61, 2. Here, in the armor of God, we have parts of it, some from other parts of Isaiah that we've already covered, but here we have this breastplate of righteousness and helmet of salvation, which in Isaiah then goes to vengeance. But that's not cited here. Just like it wasn't cited in Luke 4, 18 and 19 when Isaiah 61, 1 and 2 was cited. Why? Why not cite the whole thing? Because the church age is not the age for taking vengeance. It's the age for finding salvation from our sins. Now is the age for the blood atonement, which was once for all, the forgiveness of sins, setting at liberty the captives, and so on. Right now, and it goes on through the whole church age. Eric was talking about the vengeance part in Sunday school today. That's future. That's what we need to know. Now, here's the astonishing thing. Through almost the entirety of church history, the church has got this wrong because they want vengeance now. Honestly, let's have wars. I think Christ needs an army so he can defeat the pagans. Let's do it. They had the Hundred Years War, the Thirty Years War, the Crusades, conquering, taking territory. We're going to set up Kings over nations. We're going to have a Catholic king over this one as a result of a war. A reformed king over this one as a result of a war. And so we have wars to decide what church rules over 
What nation? But vengeance isn't for the church. Vengeance is mine, says the Lord, I will repay. We've got to be patient. That comes later. We all understand why we wish it would come sooner. It's horrible. Even so, come quickly, Lord Jesus. Yes, I, that's the Lord's prayer. Did you know the Lord's prayer is a prayer for the return of Christ? But thy kingdom come, that's the return of Christ. Listen. Let me, th that's a good illustration, just the Lord's Prayer. What if we just took that? What did the Roman Catholic Church do with that one? Try to understand it? No. Use it for punishment for sinners. Forgive me, Father, for I have sinned. I did all these terrible things. Okay, he said, go say so many our fathers. It's our father. That's the Lord's Prayer. Oh, I'm going to punish you and make you pray to God, you wicked sinner. Punish, punish, punish. But what do they do? They create meaningless repetition. It doesn't mean anything. You're not thinking about who God is. You're not thinking about what forgiveness of sin is. You're not thinking about once for all. You're not thinking about even so come quickly, Lord Jesus. We're not thinking about how we need Christ to keep his promises. We're doing these religious duties because somebody told us to falsely in the name of God, and we never even think about it. And you think all oh, those terrible Catholics. The Protestants have the same thing. I've got books in my uh, research library of just huge pages of checklists that you're supposed to go over, and then you have incantations. You have renunciations and affirmations. I renounce, and then you go through everything in your checklist. I affirm, then everything else. Neil Anderson. With Christians like Neil Anderson, you might as well just go back to Rome. And the, the book I have, and we're covering that right now on our, one of our podcasts, it says over a million copies sold. Well, no wonder the church is confused. Are we going to stand firm in Christ as we're commanded in Ephesians? Or are we going to become like the Roman Catholics and just, I affirm, I renounce, I affirm, I renounce, I affirm, I renounce. Oh, I forgot a curse. Maybe I got a problem. Let me think about processing my past and get this all straightened out. No. Dear ones, we got to get a clue. That's not what it is. If that's what we're supposed to do, why is it not in the scripture? Why didn't Paul know about it? Why didn't Peter know about it? Why didn't John know about it? Well, because they weren't as smart as these new preachers? No, because it's not how it works. Vengeance is later. We don't need to take geographical territory. The king is reigning from heaven right now. And I've been talking to you about that. Now, let's um, go to the next slide here. Let me get... <laughs> I got too many pieces of paper. Ephesians 6, 17b. And the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. Now, is this the kind of sword that you hack people into pieces? Send them to hell. Don't wait for, don't pass go. Don't collect $200. Go directly to hell. Because the church come with their army and killed you. We're going we're gonna to destroy and kill all of these people as the church? No. These religious wars are an affront to the gospel. Thousands of years of religious wars because the church wants to take vengeance. There are still people calling for that. I read a book rebuking that whole thing called Vengeance is Ours. <laughs> right, oh. No, that's not what the Lord said. He said, vengeance is mine. Throughout the church age, believers have been hated, persecuted, tormented, rejected, even killed, Jesus predicted, 
but they do so because they won't give up the confession of Jesus Christ as Lord. We won't stop trusting Jesus. We won't stop serving Jesus. We won't quit standing in the armor that he gave us, the righteousness, the imputed righteousness of Christ, faith in the promises of God. The truth has been revealed once for all and handed down to the saints. Those things we stand in. I don't have the authority as a Christian to be the agent who takes territory for God. It doesn't work anyhow. If you had, let's say you had three, a bunch of people tried to do that out on the West Coast. They Remember they took some territory? They said, well, we're not part of the United States. We're just going to do what we want here. And they had their autonomous zone, and it was just like hellishness. Well, let's say Christians wanted to do that. We're going to get this little territory, and some cults have tried, actually done this. And we're not going to let anybody in here but Christians. And we're only going to pray to God correctly, and the Holy Spirit's here. And so this is God's territory because we have it, we own it, and we're going to rule over it. Well, it's actually been done. Well, it's already Vatican City. Okay? Would that mean that in that territory that the Christians took, God forbid, Satan could never get in there? No. Would it mean no demons would inflict anybody there? Not necessarily. Would it mean that those in there would never have to wrestle against principalities, powers, and so on, as we saw earlier in Ephesians 6? No, but the battle will still be raging. See, you can't take a geographical territory, call a Christian, and say, there, we won the battle. Because the whole world lies in the power of the evil one, but the whole world is also under the sovereignty of God. And so the sword of the Spirit is the preaching of the gospel by which people are removed from the domain and authority of Satan and transferred into the kingdom of God. And therefore, they're under Christ the King who reigns on the throne as prophesied in Psalm 110 and verse 1. Every Christian has access, and I'll preach on this next week, directly to the throne of God. You don't have to buy an airplane ticket. It's a good thing. It's not much fun trying to get an airplane nowadays, is it? With all the, it's just it's amazing how hard it is for anybody to try to fly anywhere. Well, the good thing is we can go all the way to heaven in our prayers by trusting God and believing his promises. He hears us. So the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God, the word here is rhema, which not exclusively, but often, most often refers to the spoken word. So the preaching of the gospel and the citing of the truth of the word of God is a way that we stand. Jesus cited Deuteronomy 8 and verse 3 when tempted by Satan. Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. Gospel preaching is God's mean of delivering, means of delivering people from Satan's Domain. The scriptures are inspired by the Holy Spirit. We know they're right from God. And people, uh, you just need to know if any young uh, men are considering ministry, I want you to know this. Learn the scriptures. Know the truth of the Bible. Be committed to that beyond anything else as far as what's important in ministering to the saints. Here's why. Every single Christian, who is somebody who is born of God, is born of the Spirit. Okay? Every Christian, if they're really a Christian, they're born of the Spirit. The Word of God is inspired by the Spirit. When we publicly preach and teach the Word of God, the Holy Spirit, who inspired the, uh, the scriptures, will 
feed the hearts and souls of everyone born of the Spirit. We're born again with a hunger for the Word of God. Pastors, if you want to see people grow, teach the Word of God, and the clearer it is and the more straightforward is preached, applied, and taught, the more powerful it will be in changing people's lives. That's the Word of God. And that God has, is attached to the promise of God. The sword of the Spirit means the sword that comes from the Spirit, generative of source. All scripture is inspired by God, 2 Timothy 3.16, profitable for teaching, reproof, correction, training, and righteousness. That's it. Wow. Why do anything else? Why go to the church growth seminar? Why do the Purpose Driven Life program? Why take a Myers-Briggs uh, test to find out what number you are? Why go to Enneagram, find out which one of those nine numbers you are? Why go to uh, Eastern-style meditation? Why do this? Why do that? You can have the real thing directly from God, the powerful word of God that changes lives, that divides asunder even the thoughts and intents of the heart. Hebrews 3, 7 says this, as the Holy Spirit says, and then quotes the scripture. The scriptures are the Holy Spirit speaking to the church. Hunger for it. This is how people are transferred from the domain of darkness into Christ's kingdom of light. The overcomers in Revelation 12 overcame by the word of their testimony. The blood of the Lamb, the word of their testimony, they loved not their lives unto death. They didn't raise up an army to defeat the pagans. They stood firmly in the word of their testimony. Now let me give you a little overview. This came to me, so I created two slides. I just thought it really was stunning because I went back and our website, and I looked up every sermon I preached from Ephesians 1 about this barakah. Do you know what barakah means? It's Hebrew for blessing. Blessed be. So and there's a type of literature in the Old Testament where God is blessed. Blessed be the Lord, and then would list what he did, who he is and what he did. Blessed be the Lord, who is righteous and holy, whose mighty arm saves the captives. I'm giving, I made that up, but I know it's in different psalms. That's what a barakai is. So Paul begins Ephesians with this, uh, the Greek word is eulogetes, that God is to be blessed because what he did to make us part of his people. And so every sermon title for, that when I preach Ephesians 1, 3 through 14 had the word safe in it or safely in the, this one case. And I didn't contrive to try to get that word in there. It just fit what God was saying through Paul in these verses. Ephesians 1, 3 through 4, safe in God's providential blessing. 5 through 6, safe in God's family. 7 and 8, safe in God's redeeming grace. 8 through 10, safe in God's revealed plan. 11 through 12, safe as God's own lot is a Greek word, kleros, a, a portion that he set aside for himself. The church is God's own inheritance is set, that is for the son set aside. That's a really amazing concept. 13, 14, safely sealed. Seal is when someone would put their mark on something saying this is mine. If the king sealed something, you better not unseal it without his permission or you're, you're a goner. This belongs to the king. For the Christian, we're sealed with God's seal. It means nobody can tamper with us. We're God's. So Ephesians 1 starts with telling us that we're safe. We're safe. 
That's the beginning. The last chapter, Ephesians chapter 6. So look at what's in chapter 6, especially toward the end, with the warfare. So before we even know anything about warfare, we already know we're safe. That's already settled. We bless God because he's the one who made us safe, and he did so for his own glory. I pointed out in Barakah, three times it says, to the glory of his grace, or his powerful grace. So let's look at now the ending. Let's put this together. Look at the book ends. Ephesians 6, 10 through 11, empowered to stand against the devil. Verse 12 describes our battle against spiritual darkness. There, the word stand was not in the title of my sermon anyhow, but it's telling us what the battle is about. Spiritual powers of darkness are attacking us. And they stick to their job, sadly. Ephesians 6.13, be armed and stand your ground. The word stand is found four times, I think, in very few verses. Ephesians 6.14, stand firm in Christ. Don't go anywhere. Don't move. Don't get knocked off your feet. Ephesians 6, 15 and 16. Stand in gospel readiness. Right now, always, 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 the readiness of the gospel. Sword in hand. The sword of the spirit, which is the word of God. Ephesians 6, 17, our verse today. Stand with the helmet and sword. Helmet of righteousness and sword of the spirit. And then next week, stand in prayer. And I'll give you a little more about prayer. I mentioned something about the misuse of prayer today. Next week, we'll see about the glorious truth of prayer. If we understood it, it would mean a whole lot more. Another thing, some of the most important things in the Bible have been taken in a wrong way for the entirety of church history. And the general problem is wanting to be like the pagans. What do the pagans do? They use vain repetition. Well, we want to be like that. What do the pagans do? They silence their mind. Oh, we want to be like that. Guess what? The pagans got it wrong. God got it right. We're going to do what God said. So the notice stand. So why stand? Because we are already safe. We saw that in Ephesians 1. Now we need to stand where we are and don't get fearful and bail out. Well, maybe I missed something. Maybe I'm under a generational curse. Maybe I'm living in a cursed part of town. Maybe there's a demon that got an inroad and I didn't know about it. And, and there's all these things. Maybe it's this and that. We're talking about this in our podcast. No, you're safe if you're in Christ. Now stand firm and don't let anybody or anything knock you off your feet. Just get, get in that fighting position Figuratively speaking, is stand and don't let anybody knock you over. Now, let me, I made a statement here. I want to read from my notes. Standing firm does not imply taking control over or manipulating the world of the spirits to our benefit. By the way, that's exactly what the pagans did. Jesus stood his ground against Satan in Luke 4, temptation in the wilderness. I preached on that. <laughs> um, Ephesians begins, chapter 1, by telling us the many ways and reasons we are safe and that all to God's glory. Ephesians ends, chapter 6, telling us to stand firm in God's armor and in prayer. We are not told to take geographical territory and call it God's kingdom. They lay out of Ephesians is intentional. We must heed what God has told us. 
People want vengeance now, but God will bring vengeance at his time, which is unknown to us. But why can't we have vengeance now? Let me explain that. Why not vengeance now? Because the church age has a very intentional purpose. The church age comes from the day of Pentecost to the rapture. What's the purpose of the church age? Remember the one new man? The foundation of Christ, the cornerstone, apostles and prophets, the foundation. God's building on that with stones, using ministries. How many more people are going to be rescued through the gospel from the kingdom of Satan and transferred into the kingdom of his beloved son. How long will that process go on? We don't know. The church age is indeterminate. It's fixed by the father, but we don't know what it is. So if we had vengeance now, we try to terminate the church age as much as possible. Post-millennialism says we're going to defeat all God's enemies. And then when we take control, We'll say to Jesus, okay, we got it for you. Come on back. We did the work. We took vengeance. Now Jesus, can safe for him to come back. Is there any more blasphemous idea? People teach that. No, Jesus is going to come and defeat his own enemies. Okay, so what's the purpose? The sword of the spirit is still functioning. People are being delivered from the kingdom of darkness. People are being saved. They're being added. The building is going up. The kingdom of God is growing in its citizenship. And we're still integrated in this, the kingdoms of the world. And we will be until God himself comes and takes vengeance. That brings us to implications and applications. I have three we must stand as those transferred from Satan's domain to Christ. That's the key thing. Next week, be thinking about what we're going to learn. What does the Bible say about prayer? What is prayer anyhow in the New Testament? It's, it's really, again, something that's just... Everything under the sun has been done with it, but what really is prayer? What's the Lord's Prayer about? What does that mean? Well, we'll talk about it next week. But for now, we're talking about standing. Stand, because we are under Christ. We're not under Satan. Number two, God uses the spoken word of truth to refute Satan's lies. That's one of the great things of the word of God as a means of grace. Maybe you're a brand new Christian. Maybe you're young. You're new. Here's something that you'll find out. It's fantastic. Spend the rest of your life learning the word of God. And you know what eventually happens? When temptations arise, and you know it's not right, there's a scripture that's just right there. It's just, it just starts happening. Maybe early on, you have to go look it up in the concordance, but eventually, most of the stuff that's wrong, we know better. I know better. But the word of God's there, we really, wait a second, wait a second. I want to curse at that guy that just drove his car wrongly. Love, joy, peace, long-suffering, goodness, <laughs> Oh, yeah, I forgot about that. Uh, vengeance is mine, I will repeat. It's all there, and the more you study the Bible, the more it's right there, and it'll actually come to your mind, and it'll convict you and me. Oh, yeah, and God will actually change us. That's fantastic. And sometimes there's nothing wrong. Speak out loud to your own self. Don't believe that. The Bible says, remind ourselves of it. Not as an incantation, but just a reminder of what's true. And the spoken word is the gospel that saves people. The preaching of the gospel is God's means of bringing salvation 
to the lost. Let's review the passage that I preached on. Wait, when was that? 2018? 20, I don't remember. Whenever I was in Colossians, you can look it up by scripture on our website. Colossians 1, 13 and 14. For he rescued us from the domain of darkness and transferred us to the kingdom of his beloved son, in whom we have redemption, the forgiveness of sins. This, this, these two verses are so essential. I wrote an article about it for critical issues. Rescued, transferred, redeemed, and forgiven. It's our status. Rescued, transferred, redeemed, forgiven. It's all right here. Uh, the reason transfer is not on the title is there wasn't enough room. PowerPoint only has so much room. Now, uh, but it's very important. The Bible continually reminds us of our status in Christ. And we need to believe God's promises and stand. We're safe, therefore stand. That's Ephesians. We're safe, therefore stand. This status is the position of the saints with their helmet of salvation. Put on the helmet. By the way, the reason it has kind of unique language in the Greek is it's trying, Paul is covering both the sword and the helmet with one word. Deomai is the Greek word, which is an unusual word, because you would take and put on a helmet and then grasp the sword. One scholar said, uh, grab the helmet and sword. It would be, he wants to emphasize the one action. It's the last two things the soldier would put on. So, with this helmet of salvation, we are in the condition described by what God has done by his action. He rescued us. Rescued is an allusion, it starts with an A, allusion to Exodus 6.6 6 in the Septuagint. Some of the same words are found here. Ruamai is the word for rescued. Lutrao is a word for redemption or redeemed. And these are found in Exodus 6 and also here in Colossians 1, 13, 14. So it's kind of grounded in what God did in the Old Testament. Turn with me to this. Turn to Exodus 6, 5. Let's just see what God did and how that informs us about the fulfillment in the New Testament. Exodus 6, 5, we'll read through verse 7. It's a fantastic section, very preachable. God is telling Israel what he will do. I will. I am, therefore I will. Very interesting. Exodus 6, 5. Furthermore, I have heard the groaning of the sons of Israel because the Egyptians are holding them in bondage, and I've remembered my covenant. Remember, God promised that he would bring them out after 400 years. That they'd become great in number, but they'd be slaves in Egypt. That was a promise to Abraham. He said, I've remembered my covenant. Okay, so God heard the groaning, saw the bondage, remembered his covenant. Verse 6, say therefore to the sons of Israel, I am the Lord. Everything starts with the person of Yahweh and his mighty deeds and glorious attributes. We talked about that in that section on the Barakah, the blessing of God, for who he is and what he did and what he promised. I am the Lord. I will bring you out from under the burdens of the Egyptians. I will deliver you from their bondage. I will redeem you with an outstretched arm, with great judgments. I will take you for my people, and I will be your God, and you shall know that I am the Lord your God who brought you out from under the burdens of the Egyptians. Notice statement, I am Yahweh, and then I will, I will, I will, I will, 
I will. What a sermon that would be to preach. Because of who God is, this is what God will do to keep his promise to Abraham. He's heard their groanings, he's going to bring them out. The same language in, from the Septuagint is used in Colossians 1, 13 and 14, but what God's already done. He redeemed us. He uh, rescued us. As Israel was rescued from Egyptian bondage, we were rescued from bondage to Satan. Very, very amazing. And the transfer, the bringing of out, out is a different word. Exago in, in uh, Exodus 6. Here, transfer is a different word, but conceptually the same. Removed there from Egypt to God. Here, removed from the kingdom of darkness into the kingdom of his son, Jesus Christ. So that's what God's done. Every believer, please hear this. It doesn't matter geographically where you are on planet Earth. If you are redeemed, you are under Christ. You might be in a situation that's very nice, relatively speaking. You might be in a very horrible one. I was really, really sick a few years ago, so much so my... Family was worried that I was, wasn't going to make it, and you were worried I wasn't going to make it. And our daughter Jessica put out all around the world on people to read critical issues commentary, go to our website, whatever, how dire it was. And I got letters, cards, emails from all over the world, people praying for me. I didn't deserve that, I was, but that's what happened. And I didn't die, I got better. In fact, I got better than I was before I got sick. And I got one that was the most amazing thing. It came from South Africa. Because we had pointed out that, well, if I die, I'll go to be with the Lord. But if I live, I want to keep doing ministry. And they were farmers in South Africa where many people are being murdered and their land taken away. And this Christian couple said, we know what you feel like. Every day... We're serving God, and we don't know if tomorrow we'll still be alive. Because that's how severe the threat against our lives are as being Christians here in South Africa. That was a few years ago. I thought, wow. I think I have a bad when I get sick. They have a bad even if they're healthy. So, dear ones, this world is not our home, but we are safe in Christ. But I, that was my favorite response from all the people, and it was so humbling to see that these dear saints would pray for me. You could be in a really bad situation like that couple on the farm in South Africa. You could be in a country that's run by total communists who persecute Christians. You could be somewhere where you're just hated for being a Christian. We're getting that way more here all the time, aren't we? But you know what? We're still not in that kingdom. We're under Christ. Vengeance is coming. We just don't know when. But in the meantime, we're under Christ. We've been transferred out. You can't live geographically where you know you're Christian because you live in that location. And you can't live geographically where you know you can't be Christian because that's Satan's area. It's all together geographically. It's two spiritual domains. Darkness and light. So we've been transferred, and now we have the forgiveness of sins. Forgiveness, a phasis, means release. Just as Israel was released from Egypt, a phasis, release, we've been forgiven. We've been released from the penalty of our sins. Now let's look at 2 Peter 3, 1 and 2. I guess if you're going to look, I'm going to have to flip it. There it is. Because our little mechanism wasn't working. 2 Peter 3, 1 and 2. 
Notice the centrality of the word of God. Peter writes, under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, this is now, beloved, the second letter I'm writing to you, in which I'm stirring up your sincere mind by way of reminder that you should remember the words spoken beforehand by the holy prophets and the commandment of the Lord and Savior spoken by your apostles. In fact, turn now to the section in your Bible. Turn to 2 Peter 3, to verse 3, and I'll read on. This will give more explanation why vengeance is now is delayed. If you want to pray for vengeance, I would just pray for the return of Christ. Because Eric was showing us what that's going to look like. It's going to be pretty severe in Sunday school. And that's the Lord's Prayer, actually. Okay, 2 Peter 3.3. 3. Know this, first of all, that in the last days, mockers will come with their mocking, following their own lusts. That's exactly what's going on today. We're being mocked. We're these stupid bumpkins clinging to God, too weak-minded to survive in the world without their religious crutch. There's all kinds of ways they mock us. No, we're not weak. We're standing firm in Christ. They can mock all they want. But in the end, God is not mocked. Eric was talking about that this morning. What's over a man's souls that he will reap. God is not mocked. Verse 4. And saying, where is the promise of his coming? For ever since the fathers fell asleep, all continues just as it was from the beginning creation. Now they got a new slogan. Follow the science. That's shocking to me because when I researched for my book on emergent, they were mocking science. They call that enlightenment rationalism. They were going to progress through Eastern religion and the Hegelian synthesis and progressing spiritually through meditation. And now the people who mock science are saying, follow the science. Well, why don't you decide what it is you want? As a matter of fact, science just shows that the Bible is true. And God hasn't lied. Everything's the same, so just be irreligious or join our Eastern religion. Verse 5, for when they maintain this, it escapes their notice that by the word of God, The heavens existed long ago, and the earth was formed out of water and by water. By the way, science does confirm that God created the world out of nothing because of the law of entropy. That's what led me to become a theist when I was a science student. Verse 6, through which the world at that time was destroyed being flooded with water. Noah's flood. By the way, all the ancient religions knew that that happened. Okay, it's verified. Verse 7, but by his word, the present heavens and earth are being reserved for fire, kept for the day of judgment in this destruction of ungodly men. So there, look at verse 7. That's exactly what I was referring to about the delayed vengeance. Okay, there's a delay. It's not that it won't happen, it's delayed. Why is it delayed? We're in a church age. Why are we still in church age? Because more souls are being saved and transferred out of the kingdom of darkness. Verse 8. But do not let this one fact escape your notice, beloved, that with the Lord, one day is like a thousand years, and a thousand years like one day. The Lord is not slow about his promise. Is some count slowness, slowness, but is patient toward you, not wishing for any to perish, but for all to come to repentance. God is still 
patient, not wishing for any to perish. First of all, for all the church to come to repentance and get right and understand what we're supposed to understand and for others to be added to us. So the reason isn't a failure of God's promise, but it's a delay caused by God's purpose, which he alone is working out. One last section, I'll just put these verses up here and preach the gospel. Faith here comes from a hearing, hearing by the word of Christ. This is the gospel. The gospel is the gospel of Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ, according to John 1, the second person of the Trinity is the creator of the entire universe. He's the Lord, God the Son. He came into our world, born of a virgin. He did many miraculous deeds before many witnesses. In fact, the things he did, including his own death, burial, and resurrection, which he predicted, there were people on the scene of history the witness this, who had means, motives, and opportunity to refute the gospel and produce the dead body of Jesus. They never did it. Why? Because they couldn't. Everybody agreed there was no body. Why? Because he was raised from the dead. He shed his blood and he was raised. He appeared to many witnesses. Those who believe in him Repent from serving Satan, self, and the world, and turn to Christ. Believe on him. Believe on the Lord Jesus, and you will be saved. Trust in him, and you'll be transferred out of the kingdom of darkness, redeemed from your sins, bought out of slavery, and given an inheritance as part of the people of God. Turn to Jesus Christ and be saved from God's future wrath. Let's close in prayer. Thank you, dear Lord, for what you've done. We don't deserve your goodness, but yet you've lavished it upon us. May we stand firm, and may we be those who give you glory and honor for what you've done. And dear Lord, if there's any here or anywhere that hears this that don't know you, that today would be the day of salvation, that they would repent, believe, and come to you. And Lord, give us boldness to stand firm and speak the word with clarity and lack of, of apologizing, but just telling people what the truth is. Thank you for helping us, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. God bless you. Please stand for the benediction. From, from Ephesians 3, 20 and 21. Now to him who is able to do far more abundantly beyond all that we ask or think, according to the power that works within us, to him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus to all generations forever and ever. Amen. God bless you and go in peace. We survived another snow. If any more comes, we're going to survive those too. We're from Minnesota. God bless you.